Basketball has its sixth man, the unsung hero who comes off the bench to help his team to victory. Football has its twelfth man, an unseen but powerful energy that urges the home team forward. Now, Christianity has its thirteenth apostle, a faithful witness to the love, mercy, and truth of Jesus Christ. How about you? Will you be the thirteenth apostle? How many friends do you have? Are they true blue friends? Would they give their life for you? Or at least one of their kidneys? Finally, do your friends or any of your friends uh, seem like the, the weak battery, one that always saps the strength of the strong battery? Here to help uh, me, Tom Caffrey, and my co-host Dan Duddy of the 13th Apostle uh, discuss these uh, aspects of friendship is John Cutterback. Professor John Cutterback, Professor of Philosophy at Christendom College. And John, you are the author of the new book, True Friendship, Where Virtue Becomes Happiness. Welcome, John. Great to be with you, Tom and Dan. Thanks a lot. Yeah, welcome, John. It's great. Great to have you on the show. So, John, in, in, in those questions, uh, first of all, let me say this, that there's so much, definitely the past year, the year of covid the year of lockdown, going back well before this lockdown. We, I've seen, I've read more and more about surveys of loneliness uh, in certainly in the United States and even in Europe. But our focus is on the, the United States in terms of this research, because I know most of it that I've read has been done in the U.S., although the 13th Apostle and WQPH radio goes out to the world. So that means that there are many, many, increasing numbers of people, at least according to the surveys, don't have a friend. What do you make of that? How is it possible well, to go through life without a friend? I, uh, I, I, I see in that a, a serious and realistic diagnosis of an epidemic of something that really, I think, is at the center of understanding the challenge of our day. Having true friends is, is always challenging. It's challenging for us in, in, in any time and place. I think it's particularly characteristic of the age in which we live, and it's connected to other serious problems, the age in which we live, that uh, friendship is especially undermined and threatened. We have to be more intentional than ever. I mean, really, to, to form true friendship, the, the wise have always seen, you have to be intentional. You have to know what you're about. I'd say, in a sense, that's more so than ever now. And so I, it really is on my heart and my mind to try to bring the basic truths to people about friendship to help them think in terms of kind of a new paradigm, a new way to look at the problems, the challenges that we're all facing and the loneliness and the isolation that is so widespread. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and and, and John, I'm a guidance counselor. My youngest is a a senior in high school. And there's an incredible amount of darkness in this pandemic. And and a lot of the darkness comes from the relationship with what could be if it were not for the pandemic. So, and we're finding a lot of of youngsters who are, you know, really living in a a life of desolation uh, because of it. And, you know, it's it's horrible to say some of the statistics that are rising because of it. One thing that you had said to me, uh, among many things, when I heard you speak at the, the National Men's Conference, what had to do with friendship and how it relates to a relationship with Christ, and it hit me right between the eyes. And I, and I went right to your book, A True Friendship, once again, to chapter 9, and you reflect back to the first chapter where you say Christians have two special motives for examining human friendship. The first is that an understanding of human friendship enhances our understanding of friendship with God. And that the second is that human friendship is a natural preparation for friendship with God. And then just to paraphrase you you, a little bit, you you say, so this leads to a readiness to turn to the, the very perfection of the Christian life, which is the supernatural charity or friendship with God. And then you go on and it kind of circles in a very nice way you say, and then after examining friendship with God, we will conclude by considering how this friendship with God now, to me, kind of circles back, and completes the circle. As you say, it transforms the human friendship now because of the relationship 
with God. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Dan, I mean, you've just kind of gone to, you know, encapsulating, I'd say, really what's at the heart of the astoundingly beautiful plan of God, the providential gift of we're made for relationship. We're specially made for friendship. And the more that we come to know the gift of God, you know, I always think of that line from our Lord, if only you knew the gift of God, if only we recognize, you know, such a great reason for hope, the astounding things to which he calls us and how it all fits together. So, I mean, you're referring to there how our, our human friendships are going to prepare us for our relationship with the Lord and then and kind of culminate in it. But then the beauty of our relationship with our Lord is going to redound back then and feed back in and make our human friendships be more than they ever could have been because they now have this deeper root, this deeper sharing. This friendship is always about sharing life together. What greater thing is there to share than our commitments to living in the Lord together? And so it's, it really is just so beautiful how it, it you know, working on our true friendships with human persons is part and parcel of trying to grow in our relationship with Christ. And that's really, you know, who expresses that so beautifully is one of the main authors I like to use, St. Alred, a great medieval theologian, who mm. just says, God is always at work in our human friendships. And it's, it's a very encouraging thing, e- e- even when they're not going as well as they should be. It's like we, we need to understand sometimes that, you know, the, the storyline is going to have some painful twists and turns. But God has providentially been at work. He always is. He's, he's inspiring us and moving us and drawing us to grow closer together in our, in our human friendships because it is his plan that those are forming us into the person he wants us to be. That's why St. Alaric says that true human friendship is the highest step towards perfection. He's saying this as a Christian. So it's, it's building so beautifully on a wisdom that I love that is already so beautiful in itself. I, you know, much of the book is laying out basic principles from Aristotle, you know, the great ancient philosopher, pre-Christian, who saw by the light of natural reason so many great distinctions and key features and aspects of what goes into a virtuous friendship. So that's a key piece of the puzzle in helping us understand what we're after here also. Yes, and referring to Aristotle in the book, I thought it was, that, that leads to the, one of the more enlightening things that you had said to me was Aristotle uh, uh, was, you know, three, what, 400 years before Christ, and he had said because of the vast differences between us and God, a friendship just cannot be had. And then, then we have in John 15, you go to John 15 in your book, and there's Christ saying to, to the apostles, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a uh, that man lay down his life for his friends. So if Aristotle lived during that time, as you say in the book, um, you know, Jesus Christ, the God-man, continues to say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does, it, does not know you, what, what, does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. That is so liberating, John, to me. And you said that, it, yeah, like it, it, right, Tom? I mean, it just bangs, it brings right to you. And Tom and I always talk about friendship, John. Right, Tom? I told uh, Dan when I got the copy of, the, of the, your book, John, the first page I opened it up to, I think it's 60, 68, page 68. Friendship, the intellectual virtues, and good conversation. Yeah, conversation, right. Mm-hmm. I love that particular point, Tom, because I think that this is an instance of where, in the wisdom of the ancients, it's going to show us the basic features of what friendship is, and then and then we can see how they're going to carry over and apply to the relationship with God. Let's just focus for a moment, because this is what St. Alred also does in his great book. He just says, look, we got to focus on what it is to have friendship with human persons, because that is God's plan for us. We need to understand the distinctions. So, so let's know something here. Let's just step back for a second. Aristotle teaches us a lot about how to use the word friend. And friendship. There are, there are different kinds of friendships, and legitimately, we need to see how there are different levels or kinds. Aristotle famously distinguished between friendship of pleasure, friendship of utility, and friendship of virtue. Quickly, the friendship of pleasure kind of we enjoy 
being together. We enjoy the same things. We have a good time together. You know, then, 2,000 years ago plus, as well as now, we, we call people friends simply because we enjoy being around them. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a looser use of the term friendship an illegitimate one, but we need to recognize her for what it is. Same thing kind of friendship of utility, usefulness, a business relationship, you know? You, you help one another out. You, ha you have some regular... Inter you don't really go deeper, right? This isn't about really a deep life sharing, but there is a sharing, right? There is a real sharing together in this kind of relationship. So friendship of pleasure, friendship of utility, you can call those friendships. And a good man, a good person is going to have those relationships in his life. But then Benet says, but look, but then there's this unique one, the one coming back to where we open today, that where really isolation and loneliness is banished, where you can really go deeper, you really know and are known. Because as human persons, we have a profound desire and frankly a need to see and to be seen, to know and be known, to have someone be able to understand, even if it's just one person out here suffering something very great, if at least just one person could be here with me in this, what a difference it would make. And so there's this deeper kind of relationship where I mean, we, we know from experience people can have these more shallow ones and still be very lonely and isolated, but there's the, the deeper kind you really only strive to go after it with a very small number of people. So that's part of the thing that I focus on in the book is to make the distinction between the different kinds of friendships and then recognize you can really only go deeper with a few people when you discern who those are. So to circle back here to conversation, well, you know, there's conversation and there's conversation. But how do, how do we cultivate the real rich kind of conversations that are characteristic of the deepest kind of friendship? Mm. That's an art. That's an effort. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. It takes character. Intentional, too, being intentional. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Going back to it earlier, closer to the introduction, and uh, talking about the surveys and whatnot, the book that always comes to mind uh, is, I think it came out in 1991, uh, Robert Putnam, a social scientist, entitled Bowling Alone. Mm. And... He had gone around the country doing his social science work and uh, surveying many towns throughout the country. And he found decreased civic participation, decreased volunteerism and charity work. And he noticed this also, and reason for the title of the book is going to bowling alleys and finding increasing numbers of alleys having lanes with only one person as opposed to the way it was for, let's say, the previous, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, where it was almost exclusively teams. And that's why he titled the book Bowling Alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the idea of intentionality, uh, where you, it's an act of our will. The way that Dan and I became friends was I had the difficulty of a divorce that I did not want, uh, I guess it was a couple of years before this particular contact that Dan and I had, and I uh, and I had started got, started going to a new church, and I said, you know, part of my identity is gone. It's uh, I was best friends with my wife, and I was husband, but I was no I no longer had that, so I had to be more intentional because I needed. I knew I needed it. I could feel the ache. And uh, so I don't know what made me go to this site that Dan used to have uh, or an affiliation with another site. And I read it was one blog post by him. And I thought, wow, he and I are about the same age. And he's this bold about his faith publicly in this faith statement that he made in this blog. And so I replied to him. I'm not sure if I was the only one to reply, but I replied to him. Within a few days, we met in a diner uh, over a cup of coffee and then uh, agreed to work in the vineyard uh, and, and, and from that point on. And we have, and it's, uh, it's, it's been more than 10 years now. So it's just a lot of beautiful things have happened. I did that because I needed that. I felt this urgent. I said, I, you know, I, I, I can't, I got to start making moves in this part of my life and that part of my life. And a great friendship has formed. So I think that's, right. a, that's a lesson for me. I keep thinking about it, but it's a lesson for others, too. It can happen if yeah. you put yourself out there. But not if you stay home in front of a 75-inch TV and you have all the trappings, all your, your snacks and whatnot. 
you got your smartphone, you got your Facebook friends that might number in the tens of thousands, but you are lonely. So I think yeah. that uh, I think people need to know that, like you said, it takes work. It takes work to initiate it. You know, to initiate it, to grow it, to live it out. It certainly does, and this is this is dependent upon where we are in life. I mean, a lot of people that I speak to, you know, they say, "Look, this is challenging. I want to do it. I don't know." I can't find anyone to do it with. I can't find people that are interested in going deeper. I can't find people that are interested in deeper conversation. I can't find people that are, uh, you know, share my same basic principles in life. Depending on your circumstances, that can be a real challenge. So as Christians, we have something going for us here. And I say, look, this is following St. Alred. St. Alred pointed out, you know, the ancients, and this is true, Aristotle says the, the real thing, though it is really what most of all kind of constitutes the living out of human happiness is living in these kinds of relationships. But at the same time, they tend to be rare. They're so difficult. It requires so much, both in terms of character and the people, and then certain things just kind of happening and, and coming together. It, 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 it's, it's rare. So St. Alred says, thank God we have our Lord saying to us, ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find. We need to pray as Christians. We need to make this. Are we doing this? Are we praying to find the people to go more deeply with, to grow friendships, to be more capable of friendship ourselves? So I, I really say to people, look, I understand there's a lot of us are in difficult circumstances. Wherever we are, we need to just in any case need to be sure that we're doing all that we can be doing. There's always an aspect of friendship that's gift. It can't be demanded of somebody. We can't snap our fingers and make it happen. So we yeah. begin by praying to the Lord. But help me become the man, the woman I need to be so that I can be capable of being a real friend. And that means I need to be growing in virtue. I need to be growing in unselfishness. I need to have interior recollection. I need to have silence in my life. I need to be trustworthy. A whole set of things that are the central aspects of character. I need to be praying to grow in that way. That's one thing I can already be doing to prepare. And then, Lord, give me discernment. Send me people and help me to see. One thing that St. Alred really goes after is it's not about being judgmental, but it's about being discerning. Friendship is always about truth and reality. You don't try to go deeper with someone where it's pretty evident that it's not going to work. This is to fly in the face of reality. It's always a mistake to pretend or to try to force a relationship that's not going to be possible. So we'd be very discerning. And St. Albert gives certain things that you look for. And, fun, and you know, I go into that in more detail in the book, but it's basically a matter of character. And looking, does the, is this person showing an interest and a capability to share a deeper, richer life together? And then, again, we're intentional about looking for context. I love to say this. We have to find context, and that's especially the, what is being taken away from us in these times of, of quarantine and separation and people, as you say, you're sitting in front of their computer and their television, and we're so busy. We're so mobile. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain stability and a willingness to plug in and cultivate something deeper. That can be a matter of choices that we make. We do have to do our part in making these things happen. Mm -hmm. Hey, looks wonderful. I, I, John, I, I just want to get back to one thing real quick, and just the realities of today and what, what how Tom opened up. We had said we just a quick review that you know friendship, you know, is uh, gives us an understanding. Human friendship gives an understanding and enhances our our understanding of friendship with God. And then we went to where uh, God's friendship with us kind of helps us to transform human friendship. Now. Take that to today in social networking and the definition of quote, I'm holding up quote signs with my fingers right now, friends that we have today and how compromised that definition is, how does that, that all relate to now our faith issues in the world when social networking and that definition of friends is worldwide? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that, there's, a, there's a lot going on in there. Uh, you know, I mean, shallowness replaces death. You know, connection replaces presence. And so there's, there's, there's so many parallels of a relationship with the Lord. You, you know, for Christians, we recognize how our Lord's calling to friendship. What does that mean? It means being in his presence. It means taking time 
in his presence of the word, in his presence sacramentally, mm -hmm. to, to be, again, willing to simply spend the time together having a rich conversation. It, the rich conversation is the thing I want to keep coming back to because we, we've lost a sense of what this really is in, in the kind of context that particularly enable it. Again, this, this in, in both our spiritual life and our our liturgical practices often, mm -hmm. as well as then in our private life. And so that's where our human relationships, these things feed off of one another. We're going towards more of the shallow and appearance across the board. Right? This is what the social media and our technological habits are encouraging us more towards connection, virtual supposed quote presence versus real presence. Look, there's a place for, there's a place to be connected virtually. There's a place for that. We need to recognize the truth of human nature. Human presence is ultimately in the body. And this is why sacrament is so important in Christianity. Our Lord wants to be bodily present to us and, and present to us in and through material things. He always, he always remembers in the economy of salvation, he remembers what our nature is and, and what human presence is like. That's why he wanted to be with the apostles and spend all that time with them bodily speaking. So we need to put a priority on that both in our human friendships and our relationship with the Lord, and they feed off of one another. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. In the couple of minutes that we have left, I noticed uh, uh, on what undermines friendships. So we've talked so much about building friendships. Uh, what what undermines them? You you have four four uh, characteristics. One is verbosity. Okay, people talking too much. It's like the uh, the Zen master and the student goes to Zen master and says he wants to learn. He wants to learn. But he keeps talking. He keeps talking. And while the, while he's talking, the Zen master keeps pouring the tea into the uh, students the prospective stu students cup. And he keeps pouring. And it's overflowing. And the, the student prospective student says, Master, Master. It's overflowing, and he said, "As you are, you've got. To, you have to empty yourself so you can learn, and and so you can build a relationship. You can't keep talking or talking only about yourself. The other one is suspiciousness. Another one is fickleness, and I thought this one really caught my eye. The irascibility. Uh, I'll quote a little bit of it. It is difficult indeed for one often aroused by the passion of anger not sometimes to rebel against a friend." Hence, Scripture says, do not make friends with hot temper or walk with the man of violence, lest you learn his ways and bring scandal to your soul. And it often refers to too much anger or misdirected anger or what might be unresolved anger from the past. So these anger issues, these, these saboteurs of friendship, uh, we see them often. And we also have to be introspective and say, are we doing the sabotaging of prospective friendships. Right. right. It's and not Tom, just... I think, yeah, I think those points bring us back to the you know, great insight that was there in Aristotle of the intrinsic connection between character, truly good human life, which consists in virtuous living, and real friendship, which is living together. It's a fundamental lie of our age. You can you can live a human life however you want. That translates into the lie. So therefore, you can live in relationships however you want. Mm -hmm. But the great the great objective truth seen even 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 by the pagans of there there's a real standard. There's a natural standard of good human life, and what's required us if we're really going to be flourishing as a human person. So then, true love in friendship is wanting that for one another and pursuing that. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect at it. Friends fail, but they're on a project, an intentional project, to help one another become a certain kind of person. And that's that, that's why these these moral failings, I guess, not that any moral failing at all will immediately disqualify someone. We have to have we have to have nuance. But as as you quoted there, you know, Scripture is pointing out Saint Albert is is seconding that. Hey, you know, people with like deep unresolved anger issues. This is going to be consistently undermining your ability to live together in a deeper way. It doesn't mean that you abandon them. You can still have a relationship with them. You can still reach out to them. But you can't go deeper with them in the kind of relationship that we're talking about being intentional about. 
So to be really aware of, as you say, the saboteurs, the, th- the things in us and others that are going to prevent us from having this kind of friendship. I, I, I just want to say focusing on going deeper with a few is never to exclude others. It's going to help you become the man that's going to be better able to love and serve and be with everyone else. You're not abandoning other people by focusing on true friendship with a few. You're going to become who you're called to be, and it's going to enrich all your other relationships, too. Amen. That's a great way to close up this, uh, <laughs> we needed, this we discussion. Needed hear, we needed to hear that. Yeah. Yes, John. John, there are a couple of things I would like to run more deeply uh, with you about. Uh, Danny Boy? Very inspiring conversation, and I truly wish we had more time. <laughs> Tom, we're going to have to go with a part two, if that's all right with you, John. We'd love to have sure. you back and run more deeply. Love to. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I'd love to. Thanks so much. It's great, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Always good to talk about these things. And, 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 and I appreciate your taking this opportunity to do it together. So uh, thank you so much, John. It was really, really very much enjoyable and such a necessary conversation today in the state <coughs> that we're in with regards to true friendship. Thank you so much. So thank the, you. You're welcome. Again, God bless you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the, the uh, title of the book is True Friendship by Ignatius Press. I want to thank Ignatius Press for their review copy and for arranging this interview. Uh, author John Cutterback philosopher. And John, I just want to say, I just imagine, we don't have any time for you to go into this. We'll have to save this for part two. But when you go to dinner parties and people say, what do you do? I'm a philosopher. I want to know whether one or both eyebrows go up. But we'll save that for uh, for part two. John, yeah, thank I'm you very much. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you now. We'll have to save that for part two. Part two. It is either one or both, and we'll have, and, and I'll tell you later. If you tell me that Beautiful. if you tell me that three went up, that's that. Then we'll really have an interesting conversation. That's right. It means he has a mustache. That's right. All right. Thanks, all. God bless right. everyone. God bless you, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, stay tuned for. Prayer intentions with Peter and Jemmy, and of course the Angelus first. All that was right. A great, great conversation. All right, we got to go, Danny. Yep. Thank you for listening to the Thirteenth Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey. For more information on Dan, visit his website at www.danduddy.com or email dcduddy at gmail.com. Tom's website is faithpilgrims.com or email. T.R. Caffrey at faithpilgrims.com. How about you? Will you be the 13th Apostle?